truly is a, a privilege to be here with you this morning. Um, it, uh, you know, it's heavy on our hearts what's going on with Steve and Renee because of the, um, the significant role that they've played in our lives. And uh, this morning, as I, I, you know, present to you about our ministry and about what God's done in our lives, um, I want to take an opportunity to also highlight, um, you know, their role in our lives and take a look at some of the the biblical principles that that they've been living out for year after year after year. That I'm sure that they've they've touched, you know, each and every one of your lives, which is part of why you're sitting in this room right now. You know, we, we all serve a God who is faithful, and I want to really emphasize and highlight that faithfulness. But 20 years ago, you know, I grew up in Carlsbad, lived in Encinitas and, and, and Cardiff, uh, you know, through most of my life. And, you know, 20 years ago, I was wandering these streets right here looking for trouble. And as most of you know, there's plenty of trouble to be found. Uh, you know, for a while, Lakati was known as, as the uh, heroin capital of the world or the meth capital of the world at different points. Uh, it, there's a lot, of, a lot of problems here. You don't always see it. It's not always out in the open, but it's there. And many of you probably know family members or at least know of people who've gotten caught up in all of that. And I want to talk about how did God take someone from there to where my wife and I are today, you know, serving as career missionaries as we have been for the past 20 years. Psalm 14, verse 1, says, The fool says in his heart there is no God, that they are corrupt and they do abominable deeds. I think that's a perfect description of who I was. Even though I was raised Christian, my, my parents are actually here this morning. Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> They're just right over here. Uh, and they, they did an incredible job uh, raising me. Yet I, I chose to reject what I knew about God, and I, I went down my own path. Um, I always connected God with morality, that if there is a God then there's morality. But if there's no God, there is no morality. And I rejected the idea that there was a God, so I lived accordingly. Colossians 1.13 says that he rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and then transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son. Rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his son. And we know that, that, that there is a path that leads to destruction, but there's a path of righteousness. And by God's grace, he's allowed us to continue to walk that path. And our lives are very different today than they were 20 years ago because of Christ's work in our lives. Uh, I actually was uh, in jail in uh, Vista when I, when I came to know the Lord at 21 years old. And um, I'll, I'll spare you the details of the story, but by God's grace, I got uh, released early from a five-year prison sentence. And uh, I met Pastor Steve soon after that. And Steve and Renee, you know, essentially brought us into their family and, and just began to shepherd us. And... Um, if I can get this up here, I've got some. I had to go into the archives to get some good pictures for you guys. It's funny, actually. Um, some of you may know Christian and Shantae sitting in the back. They they were uh, we, we Steve discipled Jacqueline and I uh, to become the youth pastors at the church here, and uh, and they were in our youth group. I think. You, Christian, I think you were 12, 13 when you first came here. <laughs> he was a little troublemaker too, but <laughs> he's doing okay now, so that's good. Sorry, guys, having a little technical difficulties, but so does anyone recognize the 
The wedding picture? No. <laughs> yes, of course. Uh, yeah. Right out here, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so this is uh, this was Jackson and I. I'm so bad. I'm gonna get in trouble now. 18 years ago, I think, something like that. <laughs> uh, and you know, we we were both really into surfing. We both really enjoyed, uh, you know, that lifestyle, and we still do. Um, Jacqueline, not so much anymore, but I still take every opportunity I can get. Um, there's a there's a few uh, couples here that I want to uh, just highlight for a second. Um, you know, of course, in the center. You know, right right here on the stage, right. That you know that was 18 years ago, and and it, it started with um, Steve and Renee doing our premarital counseling, and uh, just the the understanding of discipleship that Steve has is incredible. Uh, I've been in full time ministry for almost 20 years, and I didn't realize how rare that it was. Um, you know, too many, unfortunately, you know, many churches just fall in the model of. You know, you show up at church at Sunday, on Sunday, a message is presented, and you go and try to be a good person and come back next week. Um, as opposed to this life on life where you actually live life together, you engage on a personal level where you know someone intimately, they know you, you know them. Um, so we had discipleship modeled to us from the beginning. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, and trust these to faithful men who will be able to uh, teach others also. So this is Paul talking to Timothy, his disciple. He spent, I believe it was 16 years up until this point. So it was from about 50 AD until about 67 AD, so it would have been 17 years, um, that Paul had been mentoring Timothy as they did church planning together, ministry together. Um, And then, you know, now... Paul, this is a, one of the, the prison epistles. So Paul is in prison, and he's writing to Timothy, his disciple, and he says, The things that you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So we all know it's the, the truth that sets us free, right? We're the presenters and defenders of the truth. The, the, it's the gospel that transforms people. It's the word of God. That, that changes their lives, that inside-out transformation from the inside out. So it's the, the clear teaching, presentation of the Word of God that God says is supposed to be passed from one t- to the next, to the next, to the next. Even in this one verse, you have you know, four layers, right? You have Paul, Timothy, Timothy identifying responsive, faithful people that he's supposed to invest into. And then he says that they will be able to teach others also. So you have four layers of discipleship happening just in this one verse right here. The, on the left, you have Tom and Lila Blinko. How many of you in this room know them? Okay, definitely a handful. Uh, great people. Uh, Lila uh, is still serving went back to serving as a missionary and has been down in Venezuela working on a Bible translation. Uh, Unfortunately, Tom passed away uh, just not too long ago, a couple years ago. Incredible people. Um, But just another example of people that have personally invested into Jacqueline and I um, and helped us to be where we're at today. On the right, uh, Dave Johnson. How many in the room remember Dave? He was here even before uh, so a handful as well. Uh, Dave and Becky Johnson were also a part of this congregation for several years. Uh, very influential people in our lives, and, and, I'll, and I'm going to go back to that as, the, as I continue to share the story. I think for many of us, uh, we believe, we, we kind of have a, a, a misunderstanding that we think that uh, you know, salvation is, is the end point. It's all about the gospel. It's all about getting saved. Obviously, that's significant. But the way that God sees it is that once we join his family, once we get saved, once we're declared legally righteous, we actually join in his service. And then he begins this transformation pro- process of conforming us into the image of his son. That's called sanctification or becoming more Christ-like. 
So that process of sanctification, again, as individualistic Americans, we tend to think it's me, God, and my Bible. Though obviously, God and your Bible are significant components of that growth process. But what's missing is the community aspect. What's, what's missing in that equation is the life on life and the mentorship. So remember the last words that Jesus said before he ascended into heaven were, is what we know as the Great Commission. It's found in Matthew 28, Luke 24, Acts 1, uh, Mark 16. It's in the first five books of the New Testament recounts the same uh, you know, situation that happened. And Jesus, before he went back up into heaven, said, I've got a job for you to do. Go and make disciples of all nations. That's the purpose of the church. That's why you and I exist. That's why we're here on this planet, is to make disciples of all nations. So what does that mean? Make disciples. We don't even use that word in, in common English today. I asked a group a couple days ago, do we use that word anywhere? And this guy had been in prison. He's like, yeah, there's a, there's a biker gang called the Disciples. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, but that was probably based on the Bible. He's like, yeah, actually, they were like the Star of David. And so... Discipleship isn't a common concept necessarily in our, in our world today. We're in, in the Greco-Roman Empire with Jesus and his followers. It was common. If you wanted to become a skilled tradesman, you would submit yourself to one who was mature in whatever trade you wanted to learn, and you would live with them. Oftentimes even move in and li actually live with the person and spend every day watching them, observing them then they would tell you what to do and you would do it. And then as you do it, they would watch you and evaluate your response. How are you doing? Did you do it right? Could you do it better? Do you understand the tools? Do you know how to use the tools? So the, that concept sat very clearly in their minds, but for us, it takes a little bit of teaching to get it. But again, with Jesus and his disciples, he didn't have to explain it when he said it at the end. All he had to do is look back at the three to four years that he just spent with his disciples, right? That was discipleship. So he's saying that what I just did with you, turn around and do that for others. That is the job of Christians. That is what we are supposed to be doing. So one way that it's often presented is everyone has a Paul, everyone has a Timothy. Or every Timothy has a Paul, every Paul has a Timothy. So what that means is Every one of us should have someone who's older, more mature, further along that path of maturity, investing into our lives on a deep personal level, who knows us inside and out, and who knows the Word of God in a way that they can speak into our lives and help us to continue on that path of growth. At the same time, those things that we're receiving, we're expected to turn around and pass on to others. The things that we've learned, the things that we've understood, the things that God has taught and shown us, we're supposed to turn around and pass that along to others. And that's how God set this whole thing up. Uh, we had opportunity. Um, too bad you're not in any of these pictures, Christian. That would have been good. I'll, I'll have to dig up some more old pictures, see if you're in there somewhere. <laughs> but we had a lot of opportunity to get involved in ministry uh, here in this area uh, through you know Stephen Renee's mentorship. They gave us opportunity here at this church. We got involved in a ministry called Christian Surfers. It was like a local outreach ministry. Um, but Jacqueline and I haven't been able to have kids ourselves, um, but by God's grace, he's given us a lot of spiritual children where we've been able to invest our time and energy into you know, raising up the, the next generation of believers who can continue this, this process. I think sometimes we confuse Christianity and the American dream. You know, you get this kind of prosperity gospel often of, you know, just come to Jesus and your life's going to be all better. Or that if you have enough faith, that you get whatever you want in this life. That message is very contrary to what the Bible actually teaches. The Bible teaches that those who live godly lives in Christ Jesus will suffer what? Persecution. Look at the lives of the first 12 disciples. How did that go for them? 
Did they all get nice mansions and big lawns? And <laughs> Every one of them, save one, possibly, were martyred. They were killed for their faith. They were killed for what? Making disciples and preaching the gospel. Again, that's what we're supposed to be living for. And, and God asks us, expects us to live sacrificially for his purposes. I just pulled out a couple of verses we can look at together. God reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So reconciliation means to take an estranged relationship, a broken relationship, and put it back together. We as sinners were estranged from God. He brought us to himself through his son through his death on the cross, that he paid the penalty for our sin so that we wouldn't have to take it so that we could be made the righteousness of God in Christ, that his righteousness would be placed onto our account, that we could commune with the holy God. That's what God did. He did the hard work, but then he said he gave us the ministry of reconciliation, you and I. We're the ones who are God's agents on this earth to reconcile the lost and dying world to himself. How do we do that? Through the word of reconciliation or the gospel. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves, but instead live for Christ. So again, he makes it clear that you're, you're no longer your own. You're bought with a price. God brought you into his family. He put you onto his team for a reason so that you can play on the team. Christianity is not a spectator sport. Church is not an event that you come to to be entertained. It's a, it's a place, it, it's a group of people you gather together regularly to be equipped to do the work of the ministry, Ephesians 4. You're, you're in a training ground right now. That's why you're in this room, is to be trained to do ministry as, min, as ministers of reconciliation. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. So this whole sacrificial living thing isn't so that you can hate life, so that you can go, okay, fine, God, I'll serve you. He's saying, no, like serving me is how you find life. That's where true satisfaction and fulfillment come from is in serving God. When you try to chase your own desires, it's the law of diminishing return. You're never going to be satisfied. But when you start laying those things aside and living for God and His purposes, finally you experience true satisfaction for the first time. I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. This is your true and proper worship. In light of God's mercies, in light of what He's done for you, the fact that He did not pour his wrath out on you, but instead poured it out on his son. In light of those facts, God says, would you be willing to lay your life down for me like the first 12 disciples did? The Great Commission wasn't the first place where God expressed his heart for the nations. It's always been there since the beginning. Genesis 22, this is the promise of the coming deliverer. He says, in your seed, one of your descendants, God talking to Abraham, one of your descendants, uh, through him, all of the nations of the earth shall be blessed. So God's heart with sending the deliverer, the one to take the punishment for our sins, was always intended for all peoples, all nations. The last thing Jesus said on the cross before he gave up his spirit was, it is finished, that he fully completed the job that he came to do, which was to die on our behalf. He finished the work. He did the thing that was impossible for us to do. Then, as I said before, his final words before ascending back into heaven is what we refer to as the Great Commission, go and make disciples of all nations. So we talked about the making disciples part of it. Now I want to emphasize another part of it because it's often misunderstood. So the audience, the intended audience for the gospel is all nations. But when you hear the word nations, you probably think 
a, a political entity, a group of people that are united politically or a group of people un under the same government or a geographic location, boundary. That's actually not what the word nations mean. Uh, the word nation means, um, let me go back to that real quick. So the word for nations is actually ethne or ethnos, depending on where it's used. What does that sound like? Ethnic, right? So it's the same, that's the, the Greek word, and Greek is related to Latin. It's the same root word that we get our word ethnic from. So when Jesus said the audience, again, even uh, you know the Hebrew word translated into Greek, same thing, he's referring to people groups. So when he says, go and make disciples of all people groups, that's actually the last thing that Jesus ever said. So what is a people group? A people group is a group of people that is distinct from all the peoples around them because they have their own language and their own culture that makes them distinct from all the people around them. So does anyone have any idea how many people groups or how many, we'll go with language groups there are on the planet? Take a guess. 300? That's a good guess. A bazillion. <laughs> little lower than a bazillion. <laughs> 500, good guess. So I was, I was shocked when I heard this. I, I had no idea. I thought there was like 30 languages. Um, there's actually 6,900 distinct languages. And those aren't even dialectical variants. They're actually distinct languages, and then there's dialects within those languages. So obviously that creates a challenge or a barrier to the gospel going forth because there's no way to communicate the gospel clearly. So I have a pretty cool little show and tell I like to carry around with me. Um, I, I introduced you to Dave Johnson earlier. You know, it was right there, just outside that door, that we met Dave one day, and he, you know, he's like, he knew that we were running that uh, Christian Surfers Outreach Ministry, and he said, hey, I know a guy that uh, was a missionary, and you know, you might want to consider having him come in and present at one of your groups one time. So I said, okay, yeah, this will be good for the people in our group. It'll help them, you know, be more evangelical and stuff like that. So we reached out to this guy. His name is Brad Buser. Uh, and so Brad came and shared at one of our groups. And what he shared about rocked our world. He shared about the number of languages on the earth. He, and he shared about his experience that, you know, back in 1978, you know, he and his wife and their four children moved into the jungles of Papua New Guinea with a group that were still practicing cannibalism. They ran around naked in the jungle. The men wore gourds. That's all that they wore. And they, you know, risked their lives. They, I think everyone in their family got malaria at one point. Um, it, it's not easy, but they risked their lives in order to accomplish this, which is, this is the word of God translated into the Iteri language. It took them over 15 years to accomplish this. But then they came back here to the United States in order to share the news that, hey, there's more people groups like this still out there, still waiting to hear. So I bring this as the example of, you see the, up on the screen there, the, the green and the, the light blue, which are the two on the top. Both of those represent languages that don't yet have a single word of the Bible translated. So there's over 4,000 languages that don't have a single word of the Bible translated yet. So if they want to know about the origins of mankind, the origins of the universe, how are they going to find that out? If they want to understand ant true anthropology, the makeup of mankind, what, who are we? Where do we come from? What, how are we made up? What is spirituality? What is morality? All of these things. How do you understand any of these things? And they're left to try to figure it out on their own because when they look for the answers, this is what they have. 
This is what John 3.16 looks like for them. They've never heard the name of Jesus Christ. They have no idea who Jesus is and what he's done for them. Romans 10, 13 and 14, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That's the good news. How can they believe in someone that they have not heard about? So he's just following this logical sequence, right? How do you, how do you believe in someone that you've never heard about? And later he says, how will they hear unless someone preaches? So they need to hear the gospel in order to be saved. Ephesians 2.12 says that you lived in this world without God and without hope. They do not have the hope of eternal life that we have. And that results in the conditions that they live in and the worldview that they have, which is a darkened worldview that we often take for granted living in America because Christianity has had a huge influence on America. But in these dark parts of the the earth that have never heard before and don't have access to God's word, they live in complete and total darkness. This is a lady that I met in Papua New Guinea who, uh, as as over 50% of their children die of malaria before they reach two years old, over half of their children. But they don't understand what malaria is. They believe in you know, so a form of witchcraft. So they believe that when their children die, it's because someone put a spell on them or somehow an evil spirit is attacking them and that's how they died. And they think that spirits uh, are most attracted to good-looking people and so they want their children to be safe from these evil spirits. So they actually cut lines in their faces and... and rub different you know inks that they can find into those lines not because they think it looks pretty it's hard to even see in the picture but she has these you know just random black lines all over her face they do it because they're trying to make their children look ugly so that the spirits will leave them alone so that they won't eat them i mean it almost sounds nonsensical right but do they believe it obviously look what they do now, this is just one example. I'll share one more quickly. Tom and Lila Blinko that I shared with you earlier that were with the, the Yanomamo people down in Venezuela uh, and uh, the, the Yawana. They worked with two different people groups down there. Um, they were living with these people that when uh, twins were born, they thought that one of them was an evil spirit, but they didn't know which one was the evil spirit. So what they would do is they would take the children and go and put them on an anthill and let the ants devour the children. So Tom and Lila were living with these people when this happened, and they they didn't even know about this cultural practice yet, and they knew that these children were born, and they're asking where the children are, and that someone finally explains it to them. They run over to the anthill and pick up the children, take them down to the river and wash them off, and, and adopted them and raised them, and they, they, they're still living here in the United States today. But just another example of the darkened mind of those who do not have access to the Word of God. By God's grace, Jacqueline and I uh, you know, were exposed to this, this missionary organization who uh, you know, has a track record of effective church planting and Bible translation. Um, and, you know, we've been involved with them for about 20 years now. Uh, that, that missionary that came and spoke and did that Bible translation, he was a part of this organization. Uh, I, I want to show with you guys a video, uh, show you guys a video um, that was made uh, two years ago as we celebrated our 75th anniversary as an organization. Jesus said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, 
even to the end of the age. Amen. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. The founders of New Tribe's mission made this statement. By unflinching determination, we hazard our lives and gamble all for Christ until we have reached the last tribe, regardless of where that tribe might be. Paul and Cheryl Fleming sailed to Asia in 1937. Joined by seven others, they held open-air meetings in the least-reached towns of British Malaya. But soon, Paul became burdened for the unreached Orang Asli people in the interior regions. After witnessing his first Orang Asli burial, Paul wrote, The full realization of it startled me. Men were born into these jungles and died without one chance to know Jesus and his saving power. Rough jungle trips, combined with three years of malaria attacks, took their toll on Paul's health. When death seemed imminent, Paul remembered the plaque on his bedroom wall. In everything, give thanks. But Paul didn't feel thankful. A spiritual battle raged inside him. God showed me that he didn't need my strong back or my weak mind. But what he needed was a channel through which he could work. Paul's motto became, God plus nothing. He didn't die, but with a broken body, he headed back to America. Paul began challenging people to the mission field, but a problem began to emerge. Missionary candidates were ready to serve, but there weren't always mission boards to send them. Several men joined Paul along the way, and together the men fasted, prayed, and sought God. In the spring of 1942, New Tribe's mission was founded. As they stepped out in faith, God began to provide. In 1942, the first 16 missionaries went to Bolivia. In 1943, partners gave $17,000 to send and support missionaries. The first five missionaries were martyred in Bolivia. New Tribe's mission began working in Mexico. 1944, Sophie Mueller traveled to Colombia. The countries of Brazil and Venezuela opened up to NTM. 1945, India was opened and the work Paul Fleming started in Malay was resumed after World War II. 1946, Paraguay opened its doors to NTM. 1947, Mel Weimer flew the mission's first aeroplane, a Stinson Voyager, to Bolivia, South America. 1949, NTM entered Japan and Papua New Guinea. Paul Fleming and 20 others died in the airplane crash of the mission C-47, Tribesman II, on November 21, 1950. 1951, the Southeast Asian countries of the Philippines and Thailand were opened. 1953, Panama recognized NTM's presence in September. 1954, Senegal was the first West African country open to NTM. 1955, tape recorders are first used to speed up language learning. 1959, because of the faithful partners given, the missions print shop was able to print its first New Testament in Kuripako language of Colombia. 1967, in the 25th anniversary year, Partners gave $1.4 million that year to send and sustain 678 missionaries serving in 19 countries. 1973, Tribal Air Communication, now NTM Aviation, was incorporated. 1975, Trevor McAlwin developed the chronological approach for teaching. 1978, NTM USA Home Office moved from Woodworth, Wisconsin to Sanford, Florida. 1980, Destination Summit Assist began in order to give partners a chance to volunteer overseas or in the USA. 1989, Interface began to give college-level on-the-ground experiences in Papua New Guinea to those interested in cross-cultural missions. By the year 1990, over 11,000 missionaries had served with NTM. 1992, in the 50th anniversary year, Partners gave $29 million to see the work of 3,000 missionaries progress in 24 countries. 600 churches had been established. 25 New Testaments were translated with ongoing work among 200 people groups. 1996, ntm.org website was launched. 2002, a model for understanding the growth and development of the local church was developed. 2006, the first version of Clayware computer software sped culture and language acquisition. 
the first Robinson R44 Raven 1 helicopter was purchased. 2007, the Wayumi program launched, giving pastors and lay people a closer look at cross cultural missions. 2009, Facebook fans started supporting the cause, growing in number to over 43,000 fans. To position for new ministry opportunities, New Tribe's mission changed its name to Ethnos 360. In 2017, after 75 years of ministry, Faithful Partners gave $67 million to send and maintain over 3,000 missionaries. Ethnos 360 has planted 1,200 churches, translated 79 New Testaments, and has 110 translations in progress. Missionaries work amongst 260 people groups, reaching 40 million people. After 75 years, the vision remains the same. As we head into the next 75 years, by unflinching determination, we will hazard our lives and gamble all for Christ until we have reached the last tribe, regardless of where that tribe might be. Yeah, as I said, we're, we're grateful, thankful that God has allowed us to be a part of this organization that, you know, he has worked through for many years. And one thing I want to encourage you with is, is you know, out of all those statistics that were just shown, out of the, the money given and the missionaries sent, um, Jacqueline and I are among those 3,000 missionaries that are with Ethnos 360. And some of that the money sent to support you know, those missionaries, including Jacqueline and I, has come from this church. You know, this church sent us out almost, you know, 20 years ago and has been faithfully supporting us during that time. You know, and, that, and some of that money comes from, you know, your, your giving. You know, what you give on Sunday morning, the church gives out of that money to help support ministry efforts like what Jacqueline and I do. So thank you for that. Paul Fleming, uh, you saw in the video here, he was... Uh, you know, our original founder and had a group of men that he founded our organization with. But he said, our organization's effort shall be directed where no witness of the gospel has yet reached. And it sounds a lot like what Paul said in Romans 15, 20, where he says, my ambition has always been to preach the good news where the name of Christ has never been heard. So, and it, he also said, that, and I'm following the plan according to the scriptures. So this has always been God's heart. This has been, always been God's plan, is to continue to expand the gospel to the ends of the earth. But it's not easy, right? We looked at that. And I don't know if you, you saw that in the video, but our organization, the first five missionaries that we sent as an organization to the Aire Indians in uh, Bolivia were killed. They were martyred. They, but they understood what they were getting themselves into. They didn't think they were going on a vacation somewhere. They knew exactly what they were getting into. And this, is, this is one of those men, Cecil Dye. He says, It is because the glorious name of Jesus Christ is not known here and must be made known at any cost. So he counted the cost before stepping into it. Was it worth it? Well, there's a church today in the Ayore. Just recently, they actually sent their first, they, they evangelized their entire people group. It's actually estimated that 90% of their people group are, are professing Christians. And that they're now sending missionaries to other people groups, learning a new language and a new culture, taking their families and sending them out into other places in the jungle so that they can continue this process of expanding the reach of the gospel. So Jacqueline and I, the role that we've had on this missionary team is helping to train and send other missionaries. My wife Jacqueline, as Derek shared this morning, uh, has chronic health issues. She has a weak immune system. Uh, we were told by our mission leadership that it would be pretty foolish of us to try to go and live in one of these remote locations because she was having a hard time living here in Encinitas. 
she was getting sick constantly. And so, you know, they asked us, well, with your experience in discipleship, would you be willing to come and help disciple and mentor some of our students as they're getting trained and prepared to go out overseas? So on the screen here, you have just a few examples of students that Jacqueline and I have had the opportunity of working with. Uh, they're, uh, all, all of these are, this is just an example of some of the countries that they're working in. There's actually a few more than that even, but Papua New Guinea, Philippines, Thailand, Indonesia, Mexico, Paraguay, Mozambique, Senegal, India, Nepal, Afghanistan. These are all places that you've had a part in helping to expand the reach of the gospel. And you can continue to have a part by how you choose to engage in this process. Again, this, this is the situation that hundreds of millions of people living on the earth today are living in. They've never heard the name of Jesus Christ. How can they believe in someone that they've never heard about? How can they hear unless someone tells them, and how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? So what can you do about this? This, this can seem overwhelming, right? You can look at this and be like, I had no idea, and what the heck am I supposed to do about it? I think that's probably the most, the most common response. Uh, thankfully, it's, it takes a team of people. And it's, missionaries aren't just someone who disappears from the local church. It's someone who's actually sent out by the local church like this church has done for us. So it's a team effort of some who stay and send those who are going and then some who go and accomplish the work of the ministry. And you do that by what? By praying. So you guys can, if you're not already on our newsletter update, you can sign up out there and get our newsletter so you know what's going on in our lives and what God is doing around the world so that you can pray more specifically for that. Uh, you can continue to give financially because missionaries have all the same needs that you have to survive, uh, plus some additional ones for business expenses and things like that. So we, we do have financial needs. Um, and, you know, what, one thing that we like to present is, you know, try support us for a year, support us for two years. Just do, do a short-term commitment that you can try it out and, and see is it a good fit and then decide if you want to continue after that. We have people that support us as, as little as $25 a month. I had a friend recently who was, you know, he supports us at several hundred dollars a month and he's like, Man, I'm sorry it's not more. I'm like, don't worry about it. Like our average our average donor is around seventy to eighty dollars a month. So, you know, whatever you can afford, God can use that and multiply it to continue his effort. Uh, and then of course we we need more missionaries. We need more missionaries. Honestly, that's one of the greatest needs. Um, that's one of the things that Jacqueline and I do is help to what we call mobilize or re recruit missionaries to let people know there's a lot of different roles to play just because you don't have to be a Bible translator to play a role on the team. You know, there's guys that live in the middle of the jungle that work on generators and solar electric power systems. There's guys that just help build houses and set up houses for missionaries. There's people that, you know, accountants that just run numbers all day sitting in an office somewhere, whether it's overseas or even here in the U.S. So there's a lot of different roles to play on the team to keep our frontline missionaries where they are, pushing the gospel out into the areas that it's never been. So if you're at all interested in considering, man, is there something that I can do to help support this effort? Just come talk to us. We're here for a little over a week. We'll, th we'll take time to sit down with you and to hear your heart for ministry and to explain to you different ways that you can get involved. We'd, lo we'd love to do that. That's, that's really why we're here right now. We live in Florida, and that's where we run our... You saw the headquarters in Sanford, Florida. We live near there, and we, that's our primary base of ministry. So we're, we're here to do partnership development, to connect with people like you, and to give you an opportunity to be a part of what God is doing through our lives in ministry. So that's all I have to share. 
Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, just to emphasize again, too. Thank you. Uh, I, I do want to just go back to uh, to the, the topic of discipleship and again express in front in front of you as this congregation the value uh, that this church and specifically Stephen and Renee have had in our lives. I I don't know where we would be today if it, if it weren't for them. Um, you know, and take you know, every opportunity that you can get to connect to them. But it's not just them, it's it's the process that God established, right? Discipleship. So who is your Paul? Who is your Timothy? If you don't have that in your life, identify someone and make that happen as a part of your life. And, I mean, Derek is someone I didn't mention in the presentation, but he's been instrumental. You know, he and his wife have been instrumental in our lives as well. Um, you know, find find guys like that and get connected to them. So thank you guys, love you guys.